see you all here this morning. Uh, we have a bunch of people here that if you were the first time in this room with us, uh, they are bringing down booklets, uh, or they will be here in just a second. Uh, but if you want a little bit more about our church and who we are here at First Baptist, they've got a little bit of info for you. So whenever they make their way down here, uh, just wave at them and they'll be able to get that for you. So uh, this time we are doing, uh, during this time, for the next couple weeks, we're doing the Lonnie Moon Christmas offering. So there should still be envelopes in your pews for that. Um, we raised about a third of our total goal last week. And so continue giving, uh, continue bringing to God how much uh, to give these next couple of weeks as we're uh, giving to uh, four missions and supporting the IMB and that others are able to know who Jesus is. That's what you guys come on down. I've already talked about you. So uh, a couple of things going on this week. Uh, if you guys look in your bulletins, at the bottom there's a Christmas schedule, so that uh, these next few weeks, like, so you can know what we're doing here at First Baptist with our Christmas Eve service, with Christmas Day, and with everything else, uh, you can know what's going on. You can know when to be here, when we'll, when we'll be open in all of our services, and everything like that. So, uh, this week, tomorrow, we'll have our free team breakfast, uh, like we usually do. Uh, on Wednesday, we'll be a couple different things. Team Kid will be going caroling on Wednesday night, so if you were a teen kid or involved in that, uh, be here at 5 to go out caroling. Um, we have our business meeting on Wednesday, and then we also have our youth Christmas party downstairs. Uh, that'll be at 6.15, and uh, bring a small gift, less than $10. Uh, we'll do a gift exchange, we'll have a good time, we'll have food down there, so it will be a really good time. So uh, be sure to remember the Christmas schedule though, just so you know what's going on, and uh, the lot of interest is offering, so if you will. Uh, Join me in prayer, and we will start our worship service. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. God, we thank you for uh, Lottie Moon and the IMB, God, that uh, God, their focus is to uh, share the gospel, God, uh, to uh, all the corners of the earth, God. And we just thank you for all the missionaries, for all the people who uh, give their lives to go to many different foreign countries and places and people that... Uh, God, that they might know the salvation that your son has brought us. They might know the same uh, saving grace that we know here. And God, I pray that uh, in our life as well, that we will be sharing of the gospel to you. That where we may go, we may go God, uh, that we make disciples, that we would uh, tell others about uh, the good news of Jesus Christ. And during this time, God, with the Christmas season, with everything that is going on, God, uh, let us just be able to share with others the good news of the Savior coming. Uh, being born just like us and uh, God just the same way we are that we are able to uh, tell others that a Savior has come it's your son's name that I pray Amen Amen it's a wonderful day to be in the house of the Lord We're glad you chose to worship with us here at First Baptist as we get started it's uh, the Christmas season of course and uh, we've got some Christmas songs lined up and I'm going to give you just a second though as we stand up just greet those close by you, shake their hand, let them know that you are glad they are here. And welcome them, especially those that are visiting this morning. I already got my
this time. Sure, we appreciate you all being with us. Uh, I know you work this way, and they got things for you guys to do.
and say with me, click, click. Okay, you're buckled in. we got to go. We've got a lot to cover. And uh, I'm excited to be here with you. want to bring greetings as normal from my family. Some of you got to meet them for the Thanksgiving meal day. Do you remember that? What a beautiful, beautiful time we were able to share with you celebrating Thanksgiving. Um, this morning, I want to share with you a message um, that pertains to, well, some of the stuff we talked about um, as we, or your, the gentleman spoke of the Lottie Moon Offering and, and Scott mentioned the Lottie Moon Offering missions. We're going to talk a lot about missions, or I'm going to share with you about missions this morning. Um, you know, look at two passages, so you need to get them ready. They're both in the book of Matthew, Matthew chapter 1, verses 20 through 23. Get, your, get that one there and put something in that page and flip over to the Great Commission Scripture. You may have it memorized, but uh, flip over to, um, to Matthew chapter 28, verses 19 and 20. That's Matthew chapter 1, 20 through 23, and Matthew 28, 19 and 20. We'll read these together in a few moments. Um, as you may or may not know, my name is John Britton. I work with the West Central Baptist Association and serve as their, it's the new name, Associational Mission Strategist. You guys have, uh, I think it's called a team coordinator in Paul Liss, and where um, things are coordinated through your association. And so I'm that kind of guy over Morrinsburg area for Lafayette, Johnson, Henry County, and a couple of outliers, um, outlying churches. Um, so uh, that's my introduction, and we're going to go right into the to the uh, to the message. The questions are: I've got three for you this morning. They're called. Uh, they, they are: Why Jesus? Why Jesus? Why me? And why missions? Specifically, this morning we'll be looking at international missions. Okay, that's overseas. You just call it the Foreign Mission Board. Now we got the International Mission Board. Why Jesus? Why me? And why missions? Okay, if you've got your scriptures ready, um, let's stand out of respect to the Lord. If you're able to stand, please stand with me as I read the scriptures aloud. Um, I'm going to read from the uh, English Standard Version. You read from whichever version you have in front of you. Um, or you can read from the screen. And uh, these are special passages that relate to this morning's message. Matthew chapter 1, verse 20. But as he, this is referring to Joseph, considered these things, which were um, the things of possibly divorcing Mary or, or, you know, just not being married to her, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. This is the prophet Isaiah. Um, in verse 23 it says, Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. Now let's move quickly over to Matthew chapter 28, verses 19 and 20. That's the Great Commission. This is the Great Commission um, uh, scripture passage, one of the many Great Commission passages, one you're probably very familiar with. Matthew 28, 19 and 20. Let me start at verse 18, actually. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. This is Jesus speaking. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. We pray for you. Father, we thank you for your love and your care. We thank you for this season in which, um, as Southern Baptists, we look at the Lottie Moon off and we think about international missions. I pray, Father, you work in our hearts and life, uh, lives to think about what you may have 
um, us do? Uh, I mean, we give to an offering, Father, what can we do uh, other than that? This morning, help us to think about those things. Maybe it's prayer. Maybe it's even, uh, maybe there's a person here that might consider taking their talents to a place far, far away and serving you as a missionary overseas. Lord, I pray um, in Jesus' name that you would uh, be in this place through your Holy Spirit as we open your word this morning. And as we think about these questions, why Jesus? Why me? And why missions? Lord, I pray you'd open our hearts to see what your scripture has to say through these these passages we'll be looking at this morning. Lord, we love you and we thank you for who you are. We say, um, Emmanuel, God with us, hallelujah. And we praise you for being here with us even this morning and every time we come together. It's in your name, dear Jesus, that we do pray. And all of God's children said, Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you. So today, the first two questions will lead us to the third, which is the most important question I want to deal with um, today as we talk about um, missions. So the first question is, why Jesus? Well, here's the answer. Because he became the salvation and the presence of God here on earth. Maybe you picked that up, but in our scripture, we see that in Matthew 1, 21 through 23. We find two names. One is Jesus and one is Emmanuel. The meaning of Jesus is this. The Lord is salvation. You know, in the Old Testament, that was the word uh, Yeshua, or um, uh, we sometimes say Joshua. Same meaning. Uh, Jesus was a common name, even in the New Testament. And um, Mary and Joseph, uh, through the angel, were encouraged to name their son Jesus, which means, again, um, the Lord is salvation. Now the meaning of Emmanuel is a little bit different. Same passage, but, uh, or no, same idea that when the Son comes, he'll be named Emmanuel that we saw from Isaiah and from the scripture passage. Um, and the word uh, Emmanuel means God with us. You know that. If you if you been a church goer, you've come uh, at Christmas time, you know that Emmanuel means that God with us. He has come in the form of His Son, and He was born and laid in a manger. You know the story. So let's uh, consider what uh, what this means to us. To missiologist Robert Garrett, he considers Emmanuel to mean, and listen to this, the incarnation of God's missionary purpose. What's incarnation? It's about the deity. It's about God coming to earth through um through his son Jesus, again, uh, in the form of a human being. So let's place ourselves in this story. Prophecy was about to come alive on earth. The promised Messiah was on his way. Even as we anticipate Christ's birth each year, it's easy for our minds to minimize the point in history when Emmanuel actually arrived. In this passage, Jesus, who would become the Christ, see, we don't call him Jesus, or we don't call him the Christ until he dies on the cross for our sins, right? That's when he's truly our Savior, right? So he was Jesus until the cross. So Jesus, who would become the Christ or the Messiah, was coming. While no human eye had ever seen God, soon Emmanuel would be, uh, would be on the earth, alive for us to see. God with us. So why Jesus? Why Emmanuel? So that humankind could begin to see the unfolding of God's greater plan and purpose. His desire to offer salvation through His Son, through the one we call Emmanuel, to every person, every tribe, and every nation. Please turn your attention now to this short video.
appeal leads us to the second question, which is why me? Stop doing endless workouts. Want to know why those workouts <laughs> Thank you, Wayne. Why me? We learned about why Jesus. Well, why me? You saw it right there. Let's fast forward from the manger to this side of the cross. Jesus Emmanuel has died in our place. He has taken the penalty for our sins. He has suffered the shame on our behalf. Jesus Emmanuel was buried in a tomb, was resurrected, and spent 40 days with his close followers. And he was prepared to reign victorious, to sit at the right hand of God the Father Almighty, his Father in heaven. But before he did, Jesus Emmanuel climbed a mountain where he stood with his closest followers and allowed them to hear their mission. Their mission? Yes, but our mission? Yes, indeed. Matthew 28, 18 through 20. Can you hear him say it to you? All authority has been given to me in heaven and earth. It's come from my Father to me, and I'm going to give this to you. And you will have the authority to go forth and therefore make disciples of all men, of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And you teach them. Teach them what I have taught you to obey my commands. And further. As you're doing this, I'm going to be with you every, every, every moment. Isn't that great? That's our calling. That's our, that's our purpose as believers. As followers of Jesus, we're called to make followers of Jesus, who then make followers of Jesus, who then make followers of Jesus. Right? This means yes. So why me? Why you? Because we are individually commissioned by our Savior to make disciples of all nations. He has passed his authority on for the purpose of his followers making disciples or other followers of all nations. Let's look at another brief video together once more. Thank you. What is a UPG? UPG stands for Unreached People Group. But to understand what that means, we need to first talk about people groups. When Jesus told his followers, go and make disciples of all nations, the Greek words he used were ta ethne, meaning all ethnic groups or people groups. So what is a people group? A people group is basically a group of individuals that have a common sense of history, language, beliefs, and identity. It is pretty much a group of people that considers us, us, and everyone else, them. While there are about 196 countries in the world today, there are over 16,000 distinct people groups. Let's look at Pakistan as an example. That is one nation going by our English word. But ethnically, Pakistan has over 400 distinct nations or people groups within its borders. Around 7,000 of those 16,000 total people groups are considered UPGs, or unreached people groups. A group is considered unreached if less than 2% of their population is evangelical Christian. That is, it has too few true believers to evangelize and disciple the rest of the people group. Almost 3 billion people fall into this category. Over 3,000 of those 7,000 unreached people groups are considered UUPGs, or unengaged unreached people groups. These people groups have no churches, no believers, no missionaries, and no one actively focused on engaging them. 95% of all unreached people groups are located in the part of the world between 10 degrees latitude and 40 degrees latitude, stretching from North Africa to Southeast Asia. We call this the 1040 window. It's in the 1040 window that most of the major non-Christian religions hold sway. Collectively, they are known as the Thumb people, tribal, Hindu, unreligious, including many Chinese, Muslim, and Buddhist. Jesus said that the gospel of the kingdom would be preached as a testimony to ta ethne, 
all countries. And then the end would come. Less than 3% of our total cross-cultural missionary force is working with unreached people groups. We must go to the unreached. At the same time, it's estimated that over 350 unreached people groups are living in the United States today as immigrants, refugees, and international students. We must welcome the unreached. Christ commands us to make disciples of all nations. Jesus is alive. His mission for us is clear, yet the task stands incomplete. Together, we can change that. This video is a little old and the, well, three or four years old. Um, the statistics are roughly the same. Our own uh, international mission board works with several different organizations with uh, aligning to, to work on that task, to reach unreached people groups, and to engage unengaged unreached people groups. So I want to share with you a little bit about that. This morning, I want you to I hope that you can leave here understanding what a UPG is and what a UUPG is. That gave us a little head start. By the way, I'm using these videos because it would take me a whole lot longer to say what they might say in a short snippet. Um, and we'd be here uh, well into your dinner time. So let's take a look at, uh, at UPGs and UUPGs as we look at the question, why missions, specifically international missions? Well, because God's purpose will not be accomplished without action. God's purpose would not be accomplished without action. <clears throat> Romans 16, 25 through 27, Paul's doxology at the close of this letter to the Church of Rome um, reveals this, now to him who is able to strengthen you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the ministry, that's the gospel of Jesus Emmanuel, that was kept secret for long ages, but has now been disclosed, and through the prophetic writings has been made known to all nations, according to the command of the eternal God, to bring about the obedience and faith to the only wise God be glory forever, forevermore, through Jesus Christ. Amen. Psalm 67, verse 1 and 2, verses 1 and 2. May God be gracious to us and bless us and make his face to shine upon us, Salem, that you uh, that your way, which is a mystery, may be known on earth. Your saving power, again, that saving power of Jesus Emmanuel be uh, shared among all nations. All nations. And then listen to this. This one was on the video and it's so, so important for us to understand. If we're thinking about end times, so often we think as believers that end times are, are so close. Often it's because we are selfish as Westerners, as Americans, and we think, oh, our country is going to hell in a handbasket, so God's coming back. Christ is free turning soon, which we hope, but God's doing some mighty things around, and it's, it's all because we're making disciples who make disciples, not here necessarily, we're becoming a minority, true Christians are becoming a minority, I'm going off on a slant, I better stop, that's another message, um, but we need to understand this verse here, as we think about um, when Christ shall return. Matthew 24, 14 gives us the idea that God, uh, the gospel will spread to each nation and then the end will come. Verse 14 of Matthew chapter 24. Jot it down if you're taking notes. This is a good uh, verse to look at and pray over. And this gospel of the kingdoms will be proclaimed throughout the whole world as a testimony to all nations. Ethne, right? And then the end will come. There it is in Scripture. All nations must hear. Every people group, every unengaged people group must hear. Minimally, before Jesus will return. 
So for all the nations, panta ta ethne, ethne, for all nations. The Greek phrase panta ta ethne in the Bible, written in Greek in the New Testament, refers to all people groups. The phrase carries the Old Testament meaning of all tribes, all tongues, all nations, or all peoples, not just the same, or not just some, I'm sorry, not just some people, but all people, all of humankind. Let's take a look at people groups. PGs, we'll look at UPGs and UUPGs briefly here. Um, by the way, if you want to look up statistics, if you're interested enough in missions to learn more about these things, you can go to um, peoplegroups.org online, peoplegroups.org. What is a people group? A people group is a significantly large group of individuals who perceive themselves to have a common affinity with one another. Think of the concept of us separate, separate from them. For evangelization purposes, a people group is the largest group in which the gospel can spread as a church planting movement without encountering barriers of understanding or acceptance. In many parts of the world, lack of understandability serves as the main barrier. In other parts of the world, most notably in portions of South Asia, and that's part of that 1040 window, right? Acceptance is a greater barrier than understandability. In these regions, caste, religious tradition, location, Common histories and legends, plus language, may be used to define the boundary of each people group. So people groups, currently, this is as of December 9th, if you go to peoplegroups.org, you can keep up with these figures. As of this past Friday, there are 12,016 identified people groups in the world. That's about 8 billion people. So let's move from people groups to unreached people groups quickly. An unreached people group, or UPG, is a people group among which there is no indigenous community of believing Christians with adequate numbers and resources to evangelize the whole people group. The common criteria for an unreached people group is the demographic factor of the people group having less or equal to, and you saw it earlier, 2% evangelical Christians or less than five or or and less than or equal to five percent professing Christians that might be Christians that are not evangelical okay also churches being started or church planting is an important factor here so a UPG generally has Christian workers and a church and some church planting activity but has less than 2% evangelical Christians in its religious demographic. <coughs> so currently, as of Friday, there are 7,223 identified UPGs in the world. That's about 4.7 billion people. Think about the population of India that rises, and there are tons of UUPGs and UPGs there. So that's over half the people in the world are part of the UPG grouping. So what's a UUPG, the unengaged unreached people groups? An unengaged unreached, unreached people group has no known active church planting underway. According to the IMB, the global research office there, a people group is engaged when a church planning strategy consistent with evangelical faith and practice is under implementation. In this respect, a people group is not engaged when it has been merely adopted, or hey, we'll take this UUPG. It is the, it's the I'm sorry, it's the object of focused prayer, where it is part of an advocacy strategy, maybe with multiple churches. So, an unengaged, unreached people group 
may or may not have Christian workers and has no known church planting activity. So currently, or as of Friday, there were, or there are, 3,182 identified UUPGs in the world. That's, get this number, 277 million. That's a small figure compared to 4.7 billion, isn't it? This means yes, right? That's a small figure. That shows us that there's activity going on. There are people, there are missionaries on the field in many places where um, UPGs are uh, in existence. So there's things happening. So, let me recap real quick. 12,000-ish people groups, 8 billion people, 7,223 Unreached people groups, that's about 4.7 billion. And then one and then 3,182 UUPGs, which is 277 million. There's still a great need to reach the UUPGs. Those are the ones that likely have not heard much of the gospel or any of the gospel. Think of that verse again, Matthew 24, 14. And the gospel of the kingdom will be proclaimed throughout the world as a testimony to all nations. And then the end will come. At this point, I want to say thank you to you guys. Thank you to this congregation. Over the years, you probably have sent people overseas on missions. You can, you can talk with me later, but I don't know. I don't know you guys as well as I know some of the churches in my association, the association to serve. I don't know how many thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars you've all, you all have given to Body Moon and cooperative program. You know that out of every cooperative program dollar that makes it to the SBC, 50, over 50% of that dollar, that's 50 cents out of every dollar that makes it to the SBC is given to the IMB. So your dollars that are given um, through our denomination are accomplishing a lot. So thank you, thank you, thank you. And if we're talking about Acts 1 8, goodness gracious, you guys have likely done many projects right here in your own neighbor, neighborhood, your Jerusalem. In your Judea, which might be, for some, it's the state of Missouri. Maybe it's Kansas City for you. Um, your Samaria, which might be the United States or North America. And then, you know, uttermost parts, you probably have sent people to Mexico or uh, maybe Canada. I lived in Michigan, so I went over to Canada before we had to have a passport. That was kind of fun. It was pretty over there. Um, another story, not a sermon. Ask me about that one. Uh, so thank you, FBC Marshall. And thank you to all of our SBC churches that give. But here's the thing. Here's the thing. If we want to see the Great Commission accomplished in our lifetime, and you saw a snippet of it this in the second video, less than 3%, 3% of our cross-cultural missionary force is serving unengaged, unreached people groups. Actually, I'm sorry, take that unengaged off here. Less than 3% of, of our missionary force, and that's not Southern Baptists only, that's all missionary forces, less than 3% are going to unreached people groups. And then only about 1% of all uh, designated cross-cultural mission funding reaches unreached people groups. This means that 97% of the world's international mission, missions personnel sending and 99% of international missions funding efforts are pointed toward people groups that have already been reached with the gospel. That was so
sobering to me when I learned that. We're doing a great job making disciples and hopefully finding indigenous people that can make disciples of their own people. But sometimes we're not going to the very most important places. I'm not hacking on any mission sending organization because every mission uh, sending organization is doing great things. But there's more to accomplish. That's the point of my message this morning. There is still a need to go where it's not easy to serve. As an associational guy, I don't have to write a sermon every week. So this is one of my sugar sticks for around Christmas time. Sugar stick, for those that are in ministry or preach, they know that that's, those are your good ones that you try to hold on to and you use. I don't have to write many sermons, but, but every time I pray as I bring this message to a congregation, I pray for someone of you who might be called, regardless of age, if you're, if you're able, God might call one of you to be a part of touching an unengaged, unreached people group. I pray for that. I was praying sitting right there this morning. I was praying a couple, three weeks ago, whenever I figured out how to share this message for you guys. Maybe there's a person here that God is speaking to about this. Let me share a story real quick. We could talk about biblical missionaries, Abraham, Moses, etc., Paul, Luke, Barnabas, famous Baptist missionaries, William Carey, uh, Lottie Moon, etc. Um, all the missions giving, we already talked about that. But what I'd like to tell you a little Baptist, Southern Baptist story about a small congregation that's in my association. I keep calling it mine. It's God's association. I just serve it. Small church learned of the Benin tribe. In fact, a guy named Eddie Smith was at an SBC annual meeting when the IAB had all of its all of its uh, unreached people groups uh, with lanterns on them, so people could take one. Unreached on one wall, unengaged, unreached on another wall. People could take and put it on their neck. I lived so close, it was in Baltimore. Before I came here, we lived uh, just south of Baltimore. I was there and I asked, hey, can, can I grab whatever you got left? Because there weren't a lot left. Can I grab what you got left and, and try to distribute them to churches in Maryland? Because it's an important thing. Well, Eddie, Eddie and his wife were there, the Smiths from Elm Spring uh, on 5th. Uh, right close to Powell Gardens, if you've ever been there. Um, grab them. And the unengaged, unreached people group was the Menangan people group. M-E-N-E-N-G. And that people group was one they had to track down. Why? Because they were, um, they moved around a lot. They moved from place to place. They didn't stay in the same place. They went one time. Eddie and his family went numerous times, and other people in the church would follow. And so they chose to, as a church, look at the Mene. And it's an amazing story of how an evangelical church not far away from where they found a pretty solid village of the Mene came over and shared Christ. Well, there was one believer that came to Christ through the efforts of Elm Spring. And then this, um, I got the name down there, I'm just, I'm just winging it. This pastor came over, did an evangelistic service, and 58 people came to know Jesus Christ. Another church picked up for Elm Spring, because Elm Spring wanted to get to the grassroots. So they went and found another UUPG to go after. And you know what? They found that UUPG to already have activity. So what category did that put it in? Say with me, three letters. U, P, G. Say it with me. U, P, G. Unreached people. No longer was it 
unengaged. In fact, they found out it was not. So they gave the statistic to the IMB, which plugged it in, which changed the numbers that I wrote to. And they're working on a third. If one church can work on three unengaged people groups, and that church doesn't have any more than 40 people, 50, 60 on a good Sunday, imagine what the Lord could do through your congregation in reaching out. Think of this statistic. We looked at the stats, 7,000 UPGs, 3,000 plus UUPGs. Think for a minute, how many Southern Baptist congregations do we have in North America? 45,000. I'm not gonna say we should feel ashamed of ourselves, but let's look at the positive. If, let's say, 15,000 of those churches chose to work together on reaching UUPGs, the Great Commission would be well on its way to being accomplished in many of our lifetimes. Certainly in my son's lifetime. You met them, Caleb and Michael, 19 and almost 19 and almost 16. The Great Commission could be very close to being reached, at least this part of it, in our lifetimes. So that's pretty much what I've got for you this morning. The challenge is, what can we do as First Baptist Church of March to pay better attention to the UUPGs around our globe? Pay one. Pick one. I know you were without a pastor. But Eddie wasn't the pastor over at Elvis Frame. Call the IMB. Look online. Find an unengaged, unreached people group and just start praying. As you pray, maybe someone will be letting you go. Maybe someone young here may be called into ministry and choose to be a missionary that's not afraid to go a far distance to a place where it's not easy to serve. So musicians, come on back up and we're going to close this thing. But let's think about those things. At invitation time, you know what I'm here with? I want to first say, goodness, if you do not know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, now is the time to come to get to know him, to, to, to give your life to him, to offer yourself to him. Because he offers more than himself to you and wants you to do that. You need to rededicate your life to Christ this morning. Scott will be up here and able to share with you. I'll be over there to talk with me. Membership, maybe you visited for a long time. Visited, maybe you've been a guest for a long time. I'd like to become a member now. And especially this morning, the Lord is speaking to you about missions. You want to just come up and pray? You're welcome to do that. And of course, you can do all of those things from where you're at in this sanctuary. But please let someone or someones know of your decision. Please. So, I'll give it to you, Dave. Dave, I'll give it to Dave. Let him finish up. Lord bless you.
serving and giving and all those things, but we go on mission whenever we need this building as well. So be ready to go uh, wherever God may, wherever God calls you to go, uh, to serve on mission this week. So, Adam, would you mind coaching us in prayer today? Dear Father, thank you for giving us a place together and what you do. Thank you for all of our blessings and watching over us uh, through all of our